as Siobhan said, this is the 18th um, edition of this event. Um, and I'd like to point out that it's, it is kind of a coming of age thing. I'd also like to point out that Siobhan was the founder of this event. So on the theme of sustainability, I think this is a prime example of an event sustaining itself and growing and evolving over a period from uh, infancy to adulthood. Um, so um, I'd just like to acknowledge over the period of those 18 years, the Arts Council has had our back the whole time um, from day one, and we are um, extremely grateful for that. Um, in 2006, Culture Ireland came into existence, and as a result of that relationship that we developed with them, we've been able to invite a significant number of key international presenters, producers, theatre makers to Dublin for this event. And we thank all of you for making the effort uh, to come this year. And also some of you who've come on numerous occasions, um, we find it, again, the sustaining of those relationships over a period of time is enormously beneficial to all concerned. Siobhan is just going to talk a little bit about the actual running order of the day. And then I will introduce our key speaker. Um, the schedule for today, as in every other year of this event, is really aimed at introducing Irish uh, theatre makers to international presenters. But it also is to complement all the work that's happening in the Dublin Theatre Festival. And um, a key part of the event has always been a showcasing opportunity to show off the best of Irish work in the context of the Dublin Theatre Festival. And they've been our partners from the very beginning. Um, following this session, we have our uh, keynote speaker in the form of John McGrath uh, from the National Paper of Wales. Um, then there's a short coffee break, and then we have uh, two panels that run, um, will be, sorry, will be chaired by uh, Eugene Downs, and uh, we'll look at relationships with uh, international partners abroad and international partners close by. Um, at lunchtime, we will leave here around half twelve and head down to Project Art Centre, which is, for most of you, we know this, is just down the road. For our international delegates, it's about a five-minute walk. And when you arrive in Project in the foyer space, there will be um, a, a lunch for each individual member here in a little bit of a brown bag. We've done this in the past and it's worked very well, so hopefully everybody gets their lunch there. And we're delighted then to, if you will attend the in-development um, that's of the Made Brennan project directed by Animal Common. And then we're back here for the big session of the afternoon from half to half four, which is the, the opportunity for Irish colleagues to meet the international delegates. Um, and then following that, we're off to shows. So that's it today. Okay, well, I'll go uh, straight in and invite John E. McGrath, the Artistic Director of the National Theatre of Wales, to give the um, it was the, the opening presentation to this event, and I'd just like to say why we invited John. Um, I, I heard him speak at a conference in Northern Ireland a couple of years ago, and I just was left wanting more. I really wanted to hear more. At that point, the National Theatre of Wales, which was only founded in 2009, was, was really in its early stages. So we're about 18 months on, and I've been struck by the impact the um, organisation has made countrywide in Wales um, and beyond those borders. And when I met John in Edinburgh to just talk about him um, addressing this event, I said, I said to him, you know, very naively, um, are, are you really surprised by the success? And he said, well, to be honest, we, we kind of planned for success. <laughs> and I, I, that really resonated with me because I think it under, under, underlined the belief and the vision that John has for the National Theatre of Wales. And he brings to it an extraordinary amount of experience as a theatre director, um, having worked in New York and Manchester and London, and indeed ran the Contact Theatre in Manchester for a number of years. So I think he has the, the vision and the knowledge um, that it will be very interesting to listen to and learn about the National Theatre of Wales. And also, as we're reminded, it's only, as they say here, spitting distance from Dublin to Wales, and somehow we just don't know enough about what's going on there. So I'd like to invite John to give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. I'm glad the rowdy crowd have arrived and taken off their dark glasses and got their coffee. What were you up to last night, Linda Chapman? <laughs> 
So um, it's, a, it's a real delight to be here. Um, thinking, um, being asked to um, set up the um, National Theatre in Wales, um, of course, the, perhaps the most significant point of inspiration for us is the relationship between nature and theatre in Ireland, which is, of course, always complex, always difficult, um, often inspiring, and um, for us has given us almost, well, over 100 years of history to look at as we work out what we are here to do. Of course, the other inspiration for us, and it's great to see colleagues from Scotland here as well, was National Theatre of Scotland, who has had great success in recent years um, with the concept of a theatre without walls, a theatre that didn't need to spend 10 years on fundraising campaign, another 10 years on architectural arguments before they could actually open a building and put on plays and then have arguments about what went in it. <laughs> It should be noted as well that we are one of two national theatres in Wales. Of course, Wales had also had the prescience to set up Theatre Gennad Lethal Cymru, the Welsh language national theatre, which was um, there in many ways to plug a gap in Welsh-speaking theatre, which had often had to struggle on very small resources and was suddenly able to produce work on a much larger scale. But... In 2009, myself and colleagues like Lucy Davis were invited to imagine what a national theatre Wales, what national theatre might look like in Wales. And although we took inspiration from all of those models, we had to think about the unique qualities and the unique landscape that we were entering into. Um, Wales doesn't have the kind of theatre building infrastructure that Scotland, for example, has. Um, but it does have a history of work in the community, it has a history of popular performance, it has a history, a proud history, of very European-focused experimental work, often looking at landscape and site-specific. So these were all things that we could draw on in beginning to imagine what National Theatre Wales might be. And so we came up with our initial concept, which is what we call the Theatre Map of Wales. Um, Theatre Map of Wales involved the slightly bold idea of doing one show every month for a year, each one in a different place, and each one using a different kind of theatre, exploring in a way what theatre could be for Wales, and also using the landscape of Wales to explore the different kinds of theatre that were available for us to make. Um, we decided that we would make each place, not just not each piece, not just for the place that it was going. And you can see some of the places up there, from Cardiff to Bridgend, up to Barmouth and Snowdonia. Um, but we would make it in the place that we were going. So again, one of, I think, our, our most important initiatives over the year was that we took actors and theatre companies and located them, often in communities where theatre had historically, certainly on a professional level, not been made. It really helps when you're trying to sell tickets if your actors have been buying their sandwiches at the corner shop and going down the pub every evening. If, if it works as nothing else, it works as audience development, but I also think it made for much richer and more interesting work. Um, so that was our big idea. But we didn't start off with the first show. We started off, actually, online. We wanted to, out of our theatre map of Wales, develop a, a sense of community, a sense of theatre as a community in Wales. And we were very fortunate in 2009 that we were starting in probably the first national theatre to be started in the time of online social networking. So we didn't start with a website. Um, we started with an online network that actually was just a frame for people to build. And we invited people interested in theatre, whether they were theatre makers or audiences, or people who had a strong opinion about what we should be doing, to join that site and start creating discussions and forums, blogging and content. Um, if you go there now, there's about 3,000 members and many tens of thousands more who, who go there on an annual basis. And um, you can go up there and say, oh, I saw that John McGrath do a speech the other day and it was a load of rubbish. This is what Wales should be doing in theatre. And lots of people do, and we celebrate that <laughs> because that's what community is about. It's about having many voices. It's not having a one-way message. It's not having just branding or marketing. It's about creating a sense of excitement. In some ways, this is our theatre building, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than bricks and mortar. Um, so we set off on our journey. And this is one of the very first images that anybody saw in a National Theatre Wales show. 
It's the wonderful Welsh actor Boyd Clyde, dressed in a chicken suit. Um, and um, I did get in a little bit of trouble um, with a few people who thought that maybe this should be a more dignified starting to, national, to a new national theatre than a, a man in a chicken suit. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of um, context for this show, which was a hugely popular show. Uh, we could have sold the tickets many, many times over. Um, it was a piece called A Good Night Out in the Valleys. Now, some of you, and I've already had it today, know that I have a famous namesake, um, the, the real John McGrath, as he is often <laughs> referred to. And the real John McGrath, of course, son of Scotland and Merseyside, where I'm also from, um, had, wrote a, a famous book called A Good Night Out, which is about um, theatre connecting to working class communities and not as a... Um, sometimes misread in a way as a form of, of political propaganda, but actually talking about working class theatre having its own forms, being rooted in vaudeville, being rooted in popular entertainment. So to, um, to address the, the um, spirit of, of my great namesake, um, we decided, I, I partly selfishly decided, that our very first show would be called A Good Night Out in the Valleys. For those of you who don't know, uh, the South Wales Valleys are the site really of the um, Welsh Industrial Revolution. They're the mining um, heart of Wales and where um, the vast majority for many years of the population lived. Of course, in the 1980s, the mines were closed um, after much struggle and industry was decimated and the consequences of that are still felt today um, in a, a lot of um, social deprivation and a lot of real issues there. So we thought we'd go out um, in the spirit of, of the real John McGraw and ask people, what do you think the story of uh, the South Wales Valleys is? What story would you like to set, tell? And if you tell us that story, um, we'll make it the first piece that your new National Theatre produces. Um, I think we expected something rather noble, um, and instead what we got was a huge sense of anarchy, a sense of humour as a way of railing against society, a sense that desperate times don't lead necessarily always to um, great and, uh, the great and the good rescuing things, but often lead to ordinary people having a whale of a time on a Friday night. Um, and so our first piece, A Good Night on the Valleys, it involved um, Boyd Clark as Con, the manager of a miners' institute. The piece toured to the old miners' institutes that have been the centre of um, culture in South Wales for many, many years, but often um, mainly had, um, uh, I, I guess, tribute bands going on a lot of the time now, and um, brought uh, a sense of the joy of theatre to those venues. Uh, we rehearsed in the valleys, we spent a lot of time meeting various groups. My favourite, I mean there were dozens and dozens, my favourite was a group called the Knitting Nanas, um, who met regularly at Blengaru Miners Institute to knit um, and to talk about life and they talked to us about what should be in the show and they came to see open rehearsals and you could tell the bits that they liked and the bits they didn't like because the bits they didn't like they knitted very energetically in the middle. Um, the, um, one of the, the things, though, that that show um, did respond to was the economic struggle in Valley's towns, um, and um, it was reflected in the show in a number of businesses um, that had had to double up. Um, so there was a cafe that was also a funeral home, and lots of different businesses that doubled up. So outside the theatre, before you even got in and saw Boyd in his chicken costume, um, you were invited to um, try out Bevan's Meats and Treats, um, which was a burger van that doubled as a massage parlour. Um, <laughs> and so you could try out either of those delights uh, on the way in. And um, the, the burgers were real, and the massages were a bit amateurish, but you could get one. <laughs> The other thing that we, uh, that we learned on that show um, is that you've got to have a raffle. <laughs> and, uh, and we have had perhaps more raffles over the last year than many a national theatre with a much longer history. <laughs> For our next show, we went to Swansea, where we did a piece called um, Shelf Life, which was a site-specific piece in a, in a much more... Um, in a way, uh, site specific is much more as you might imagine it. We um, took over the old library at the heart of Swansea, which had been closed, it's a beautiful old rotunda reading room, and we had aerialists outside it. We worked with Welsh National Opera to create a community chorus that brought it to life, um, and we had installations in the stacks and in the main reading room. Uh, we made it with um, WNO and with Volcano Theatre Company, which is one of Wales's most established physical theatre companies. Um, and with this show, we really started to develop a, a concept that became really key for us during the year, which was the concept of National Theatre Wales team. 
Now, team is a, in a way a cross between a community arts project and an arts ambassador project, but it isn't either of those. What we do in each place that we work in is we recruit a core of people, usually around about 20, from local communities, ranging from young to old, all kinds of backgrounds, some who are passionately interested in theatre, some who thought they weren't interested at all, to become, in a way, advocates for the show. Sometimes they end up in the show in some form. Mainly it's about letting their ne networks know um, what, what's going on. We invite them to rehearsals. They help us make the show better. And teams become a really important part both of the impacts of the shows that we do, but also of what happens afterwards, because we stay in touch with those teams as we go along, and we try and build that presence after the show has long gone. Um, in Swansea, for example, we worked a lot with uh, uh, um, younger, particularly um, artists who felt there was no venue for them, as well as with some refugee communities there, and started getting them working together. And there's a, a, fringe, um, a fringe showcase night going on in Swansea now called Scratch That Itch, which takes place every month, which is run by uh, members of the team that we set up when we were there. So real legacies in these places, um, not only for, in a way, the... Um, community aspects of things, but also for um, the theatre of the future. Our next show um, was a step inside a theatre space. Um, we discovered or um, had brought to our attention a show that John Osborne had written when he was a very, very young man, touring as an actor himself, um, called The Devil Inside Him, which, um, fortunately, was set in a South Wales boarding house. It's sort of the show before... Um, he moved into the kitchen for kitchen sink drama. As you can see, it's still set in a living room. There were elements of it that were um, pure melodrama and really came very much from a pre-Royal Court years. Um, but at the same time, you could see the, the burning heart of the angry young man within the play. And um, we cast it, or the key parts were cast with really quite young actors, very exciting actors. Um, the um, upcoming um, Catherine um, Stewart coming out of... Welsh College had just graduated, and Yuan Rian, who had just been doing really well in Spring Awakening and on Misfits on telly, um, but is, a, I think, one of the outstanding young Welsh actors of his generation. This was a more traditional piece and was playing in the new theatre potentially to much more traditional audiences. But again, we worked hard with the idea of team, and actually it was most successful among young audiences who recognised in the story of Hugh Prosser, the character that Ewan was playing, um, a young man who ends up so desperate that he um, ends up uh, actually killing the, um, the girl cat that Katrin was playing um, that um, could have been in quite a melodramatic... Um, it, well, is in the script quite a melodramatic scene, but was dealt with, I think, so delicately by the director, Alan Bowman, who I think is one of the great Welsh directors, that actually became incredibly moving and gained a real following among young people in Cardiff and beyond. This is the final scene where Hugh goes to meet his destiny. And I saw this very much as a, a picture of maybe young people then and now, but also in a way as a picture of theatre as it bursts out of the living room and into a, a new... Um, both more realistic and in some ways more impressionistic future. Um, so working with team and working particularly to reach young audiences, we had a big assembly primarily of students and young people, uh, a big um, gathering of, of students and young people. And we um, started to work on a project called The Assembly. And The Assembly was a gathering that we did, again with each of our shows during the year, where we asked an important local question. The question in Cardiff was, is Cardiff a young city? Um, so it wasn't directly um, picking up on themes for Devil Inside, but as you can see, it was very much picking up on the audiences that we were interested in. So we pitched a tent outside City Hall um, and had a huge debate with lots of young people and bits of performances and the artists there from the show visiting to explore something that seemed of interest to um, local communities and to young people. And we also had older people there arguing the point against young people. And these assemblies became, again, a key way for us to connect with the communities in each place that we were going to. Each place we would ask, what's an important question for you? We'd bring local people and artists together to debate that point, and we'd make a dialogue between that evening of debate called the assembly and the show itself. The next show that we did, we finally went up north um, to Barmouth on the northwest coast of Wales to create a piece called For Mountain, Sand and Sea. This piece was directed by Mark Rees, again an extraordinary Welsh artist who'd been mainly working in the dance field. 
Um, but I'd become aware that Mark had a particular interest in working as a kind of curatorial director, where he'd take spaces and put work and artists within them, somewhere between a theatre or dance performance and an art show. So we invited Mark to go on a tour around Wales and find a place to curate, and he chose the town of Barmouth. Now, Barmouth is a seaside town. It's got um, people who've been living, whose families have been living there for hundreds of years, but it was also the start of the um, tourist trade in the UK. It was the first place that Thomas Cook ran a holiday to. And so it's got loads of stranded Brummies and Scousers and all these um, people from um, England who've cast up there either for a summer or for the whole of their lives. So a deep history. Um, Mark spent a lot of time there exploring the history of the place. The image that we see here is on the bridge um, in Barmouth, and it's the story that um, Mark heard from a, an older, older lady, June, um, who had lost her fiancé in the Second World War. And this is the memory that she had of running across the bridge with him. It's one of the last memories that she ever had of being with him. So Mark restaged that with a cast primarily of people from a dance background. That's the um, wonderful Welsh dancer Kai Thomas, uh, as the, the young man, and um, invited these dancers and performance artists to inhabit spaces throughout Barmouth, which he then took the audience on a, a tour of, um, and the audience were asked to imagine that they were Victorian explorers discovering Barmouth, but of course they were discovering not only Victorian Barmouth, but the present, um, the more recent history. And again, that was a piece where we used the online community. Um, we, for every single show that we did, we had an online group. And within those online groups, there's 32 pages to this group. So 32 pages of people who contributed their memories and stories about the town of Barmouth. Now, sometimes when we do a lot of digital work, people say, what about people who don't have or don't do digital? And of course, it's equally important to reach those people. One thing that we have learned, however, is don't assume who does and doesn't do digital. Some of our most active contributors on that group were um, people of, of quite advanced age, and some of the people who were least likely to get involved were quite young people. But what Mark also did was set up a store in Barmouth, um, which he called the story shop, where people could come and leave their stories. So some of the stories that he found, this is Mark himself um, performing outside a draper's shop in Barmouth, and he's playing the role of Tommy Notter, who was a great Savile Row tailor, who actually um, was the main tailor for the Rolling Stones, uh, one of their most flamboyant periods. And it turns out he came from Barmouth. What a gift. <laughs> this is the wonderful um, Marega Clark who's performing the role of one of the ginger girls who were sent um, to Barmouth in the 1950s by the Daily Mail to entice a new readership on the beach. Um, <laughs> I rather think that the Daily Mail these days would disapprove of that kind of behavior, but that's what they were doing in the 1950s. And um, this is another scene featuring Kai. Um, it took place in the disco in Barmouth, where Kai, who um, is a, a dancer who works internationally now, but actually came from close by to Barmouth, he used to go to this disco in Barmouth when he was a kid. Um, in the scene that we're watching there, he's been, um, for the last about 10 minutes, manically rave dancing in the club, so you can imagine how exhausted he is in a memory of his time there. But then um, the music's interrupted with music from the 1940s, and an older lady walks onto the floor and starts waltzing with Kai. Of course, that older lady is June, who had the memory of losing um, her fiancé in the war, the role that, of course, Kai is playing there. It was really one of the um, most touching moments in our whole year's journey. Next, we um, engage perhaps in um, what some would say is the, the newest form of theatre, um, pervasive theatre, which is inspired in many ways by online gaming. So a theatre in which the audience is asked to progress through many different levels, is asked to interact with the story and change the outcome. We worked with a company called Hide and Seek, who are probably the most exciting of the, or, or the most developed of the online um, gaming theatre crossover companies, um, to look at ideas and to train up Welsh artists in how pervasive theatre might work. And then we recruited three really interesting Welsh artists, combination of writers and digital designers, to make a piece with us. 
But pervasive theatres virtually always happened in urban environments, and we wanted to do it somewhere else. So we went um, to the beach in Prestatyn, which is way up in the north of Wales, and explored what pervasive theatre might mean for the town of Prestatyn. Now, Prestatyn is a town where, when you're 21 years old, you probably leave, and you maybe come back in your 30s or 40s, um, maybe. Um, LAUGHTER so to create a piece that comes out of online gaming and comes out of that world was a bit of a challenge in Prestatyn, but we like a challenge. And um, we created a piece which was all about the attempt to convert Prestatyn into a town where people in their 20s might want to live. These characters here are called the Curtain Twitchers, and they were part of the, the team that we recruited in Prestatin, mainly middle-aged and older people, who joyously took on the role of characters who didn't want any 20-year-olds or even 30-year-olds in Prestatin. They liked things very much as they were, and so they were our antagonists when we played the game, trying to stop anything new happen and vigorously twitching their curtains. Um, we recruited two fantastic young actors um, that went on a journey with the show, obviously through the performances, as actors do, and through the rehearsals, but also created Facebook personas, um, online identities. So there was a whole way that you could play this game uh, over several weeks and months before the show. Um, and there's our two actors, Matt and Mike, who play the characters of Charlie and TJ, who've come back to rescue Prestatin for the younger generation. Uh, I'll give you a moment of um, their Facebook activity. So let's find the first account tonight. Hi, uh, I wondered if you've got any availability uh, to camp this week. Oh, this is a campsite, right? No, it's Oh, right, okay then. I am penis Andre. Is that penis Andre? as to how much it will cost to camp um, or to rent a caravan this week for two people. For two people? Yeah, just me and me mates, yeah. It's a bit, man. <laughs> Sorry? Is it for family? Uh, no, no, it's just me, me and a friend. Oh, yeah. How old are you? Uh, well, I'm, I'm 29 and... Uh, 20, 24. 20, 24. 24 and a half. But in our 20s, nevertheless. <laughs> For that so so. So uh, it was quite a job for those two actors. They, they lived in and out of character for, for many weeks and creating that online content. And of course, it was a show that had a whole audience online as well as on the beaches of Pristatin. But there's the audience themselves. Um, and that's what you got if you turned up for the show as you competed with beach games to rescue Pristatin. The um, next piece that we did um, was also very much a sighted piece of work, um, but a very different kind of theatre. Um, so we, worked, we wanted to work very much with a director many of you will know, Mike Pearson, who'd been a, a key Welsh director over many years with the company Brith Goff, which was one of the great site-specific theatre companies, but hadn't produced a large piece of work in the last 10 years. Um, so we asked Mike what he would do as part of our Theatre Map of Wales, and there was a site that he was particularly interested in working in, which was the Army Range in the Brecon Beacons up near Sennybridge. Now this is quite contested land in Wales because it was requisitioned by the Army, people were moved off it, um, we had their, their families and their, their livelihoods there um, back in the 1940s, and it's been kept by the Army ever since. So it's a, a place of, of, of real um, historical difficulty. It's also a place where young men and some young women now go and train to um, invade Afghanistan or to um, hold ground in Afghanistan. So it's a very real and very complicated place to be working. Somehow we managed to work with the Ministry of Defence to get access to the space 
in the um, Brecon army range, which is known as the German village. It's the village that was built to practice warfare in. It was originally called the German village, not because of the Second World War, but because of the Cold War, when it was imagined that there might be a major land battle in Europe and that um, Eastern Germany would be the, the, the forefront of the battle. Um, but now it's regularly converted um, to basically cover for whichever territory the British army is involved in. So obviously it's been... Ireland, and now it's by and large Afghanistan. We got hold of that space, there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of complexity around it, and we talked with Mike about what piece to stage there, um, and decided that the um, work that we wanted to do there was East Galicia's The Persians, which of course is the first play in the Western ca theatre canon. So for us as a national theatre, to grapple with that play was very important as well. Um, the Persians is the story of the defeated Persian army. It's just been um, massacred by a small terrorist state by the name of Greece in an ill-judged um, feat of imperial expansionism. Uh, it would have been easy to update the play, but we didn't want to do an over-easy updating. We wanted to let it speak through its setting, and that's what we did. This is the um, main space where most of the performance took place, um, which is a, a big... Um, full-sized house that's used to, to display techniques for, um, for urban and village invasion. I'm going to show a, a little clip of the performance because it, it's hard to get a sense of this without seeing a bit of video. This whole shaggy beard dyed red in death, skin brilliant crimson in a pool of blood, and there are us. Wives are dead, Atavi is the Bactrian dead, leaders of 30,000 horses, immigrants to a harsh land, all dead. You told me to pray, so I will pray, and pour oil, corn, and honey from the royal store to the gods above and the many dead below. It's done. The worst has already happened. Nothing can reverse this book. Some hope. Your duty is to offer counsel, so do your duty. If my son returns, comfort him and guide him to my door, lest he inflict on himself some further sorrow to crown that which we already bear. Um, Sean Thomas, uh, one of the joys during the year was being able to invite really significant Welsh actors who hadn't worked in Wales for quite a period of time uh, to make work with us and um, Sean there I think did an extraordinary performance and as you can see from that um, clip had to double you know, really quite um, full on theatrical performance with close up film work at the same time which was a, a real complex thing for the actors to pull off but they did it beautifully. Um, it was less of a local community for that show um, because it was up on the army range. But I think one of our, our um, most touching, disturbing, um, and, but also um, satisfying moments was, um, were, was the fact that a lot of the young army lads who were out up there to do night manoeuvres would often stop and watch substantial sections of the show and at least on one occasion got the, the start of their manoeuvres postponed so they could see the show through to the end, which when you think about um, what the piece is about um, and what they were about to go off and do is, um, really speaks to the importance and relevance of a classic play like that today. Our next show was um, equally um, complicated to pull off. Um, it was a piece set in the South Wales town of Bridgend, which some of you will know has been um, notorious mainly over the last decade for being the centre of a space of teenage suicides. Um, it's a subject that a lot of people would have preferred for us to ignore, but we felt that if we were doing this theatre map of Wales and exploring the, the different places and spaces of the country through theatre, we couldn't ignore this story. 
Unfortunately, um, Gary Owen, who's one of Wales's leading playwrights, grew up in Bridgend, so we invited him to write a piece that responded to um, lives of young people today in Bridgend, not necessarily um, dealing with the theme of the suicides, but dealing with um, how young people might have responded to being put in that situation, where that was the only prism they were seen through. He wrote a piece called Love Steals Us From Loneliness, um, it was about a young man who dies in a um, drunk driving incident. It had two, um, what was perhaps really interesting about it as a show was that it had two very different halves. The first half was a, a glorious night out um, by a, a bunch of teenagers. That's Katie Ellen Salt there on the right who um, played the lead character of Katrin. Um, uh, a feisty young woman who um, drinks and sleeps around and um, uses the most extraordinarily colourful language. So we saw a, a night out um, of those young people's lives. And then on the interval, um, when we came back of the interval, we found that one of the young people had died um, after an argument in a drunk driving incident. And the rest of the play was really about picking up the pieces. And the rest of the play is... Um, spread over the next 40 years, and uh, sorry, I clicked a little early there, the, um, Nia Roberts um, plays the mother of the lost young man and really trying to piece together life. We invited young people in throughout that process to look at the stories with us. Obviously, we built up a strong team of young people um, who would come to rehearsals, give the actors notes, talk about their lives. Fortunately, the two young leads were from Bridgend, fantastic young actors just at the start of their careers, but from the town. And so we were able to have a real dialogue with young people about what it meant to portray Bridgend through theatre piece was staged in Hobo's Rock Club in the middle of Bridgend and we also had a, a fantastic online project with that piece called ourbridgend.com where young people created their own map of their city with their own memories, places they love, they hate, places of light and dark. It was an invitation to talk about difficult things if you wanted but also to talk about funny things or day-to-day -day things if that's what you'd rather do. And we also worked um, with young people to uh, create, uh, I think, a particularly strong assembly event, which took place in the bus shelter at midnight, one of those places where young people in Bridgend hang out. And it looked at um, the issues behind the play, but particularly looked at young people and love and asked the question, is love dangerous? Our next show, um, Dark Philosophers, uh, again, went much more into the canon. This, kind, this time it was the Welsh literary canon and the wonderful South Wales writer Gwyn Thomas, who wrote about Depression-era Wales in the 1930s. But as we discovered in our initial Valley show, wrote about it with a sense of anarchy and energy and a sense that it isn't um, in being noble that you shake the foundations of society. It's often in being very vulgar. Um, so this was a piece based on his short stories. We invited the fantastic physical theatre company Told by an Idiot to work with us. We didn't want uh, a realistic, we didn't want a, a reverential version of those stories. We wanted someone who'd find the guts of them and find the anarchy within them. And um, there they are in their um, set of wardrobes. Again, one of the joys has been to invite fantastic designers back to Wales. Angela Davis, who's been working in London for many years, comes from the Rhondda Valley, where, um, the play, where the stories of Gwyn Thomas are set. So she was able to create this fantastic set made entirely of wardrobes um, that conjured up the Welsh valleys and the houses on the terraces where Gwyn Thomas set his stories. Um, but with this piece, we had a piece on a stage, so we had to work hard to fulfil, in a way, some of the more located community work that we've been doing over recent years. So we um, took advantage of the fact that Newport, where we were doing the show, has a lot of empty shops, and um, along with a bunch of other artists, we took over some of those empty shops and started doing events in them to let people know about the show. And that's our Newport assembly, which took place not in the theatre where the show was taking place, but in an empty shop and pulled in people um, from all over Newport uh, to explore current issues in, in the town. It was actually probably the most angry and politically engaged of the assemblies um, and the one where people were most determined to shake up their local council and change what was happening. We also created publicity that, that tied in, uh, in a way, with that local shop and with that sense that, that these could be local issues today. Um, so the stories of Gwyn Thomas were reflected to our own newspaper and um, there was a, a lot more of that going on inside. 
Our next three shows all put the audience centre stage. Uh, the piece that we did up in Penagroyce near Carnarvon was called The Weather Factory and was created with um, David Harradine of Fevered Sleep. And he basically uh, turned a house into a home for the weather. So you went as a group into the house on the streets in Penagroyce, which is a small village in North Wales, and you went in on a hunt in a way for the weather who inhabited the house, who was maybe an old lady, who was maybe a ghost. This is the bathroom, which as you can see has been completely taken over by moss. This was the living room, which had been taken over by the sun. There are many pieces that you can't really show pictures of. One of the bedrooms had been turned into a cloud. You went inside and you couldn't see anything, but you were on top of a hill. And the kitchen had the most ferocious of windstorms. After Penagroyce, we went to Butte Town, which is the um, old Tiger Bay area of Cardiff and one of the most multicultural neighbourhoods in the whole of Wales, and in fact in the whole of the UK. And for this piece we created an audio play which took place on a taxi ride. So we had 50 taxis riding through Butte Town area of Cardiff. From your taxis you could see events happening, like this is a dance performance that's happening in one of the tower blocks in the bay. But you were also listening to a play that was about a young man who'd taken a taxi ride and was desperately searching for his father, who he knew was from Tiger Bay, um, but that he'd been um, separated from since birth. At the end of the play, you ended up in the Soul Exchange, which is the historic heart of the old Tiger Bay, the Butte Town area, and where you realised you were actually at the wake, at the funeral of the young man's father, but that that wake nonetheless turned out to be a celebration for all of the glories of the Tiger Bay and the Butte Town area. With that show, we did a particularly important assembly because there's been a lot of change in Butan over recent years, a lot of new populations coming in. There's a, a very old, um, long-standing Somali population in Butan, um, but over recent years that's grown a lot, and a lot of young people have come into the area, or first-generation um, young Welsh people who have Somali origins, and that has been a, a subject of... Um, much debate and many issues in the, in, in the Butte Town and in Cardiff in general. So the assembly and the teamwork around this show ended up being um, located really in that question of um, the relationship of the Somali community to Cardiff and Wales today. Uh, it took place in an old abandoned NatWest Bank and a um, mixed performance and debate and really became the start for a long-term project of us of working with Somali community in Butte Town. And this um, young man who is one of the um, guys debating issues there and very involved in, um, on a as a community volunteer in Butte Town has just um, come on board as a new staff member for National Theatre Wales working on a big project to create a new performance two years from now that particularly speaks um, to the voice of young Somali men and women. Um, our next show was created with the German theatre company Rimley Protocol and was again a piece that put the audience at the centre. So for this piece, and you can, still t you can still see it, it takes place every Tuesday evening on the streets of Aberystwyth. You go on an iPod tour of Aberystwyth guided by the voice and the, um, and the visuals created by different members of a local choir. You go on a tour all over the streets and you end up at choir practice at the end of the evening. <laughs> It's a, it's a really charming event, and um, it only holds 12 people every Tuesday evening. It has become a, a lovely ritual for, um, for both the choir and for visitors to engage in. And then we joined up with No Fit State Circus, and this is the piece that we've got on tour at the moment in France, to create a show called Mundo Parallelo, with the French-Serbian director, Mladen Matarik, which looks at the crossovers between theatre and, as you can no doubt see there, some very extraordinary circus. And so that was almost the end of our first year of work, um, but then we had our finale show to do. And for our finale, um, we worked with the actor Michael Sheen, who many of you will know from, plays like, uh, from films like uh, The Queen and The Beautiful Game and many others, um, who's a local <laughs> South Wales boy from Patolba. And we'd asked him what he would like to do um, as part of our opening season in this context of located work and work that had its a relationship to the local community. And he said that he remembered as a kid that his first um, 
real theatrical experience had been going to see the Passion Plays um, performed up in the local park, in Margham Park, which was performed entirely by amateurs and usually by a cast of hundreds. And he's not a religious man, Michael, and he didn't want to do a religious play, but he wanted to capture that spirit again and use the Passion Play and use the work that we've been doing with location and communities as a starting point for doing something extraordinary for the town. So we created The Passion of Potolba, we paired Michael with Bill Mitchell of Wildworks and Nehi, who many of you will know as an extraordinary site-specific director, and with the poet Owen Shears, who reimagined a, a secular story um, to run um, along the structure of the passion. And we worked over many months with local people um, and created a piece that started off with a, a beautiful baptism scene on the dawn of a Friday, Good Friday morning this Easter, and lasted for 72 hours. It was performed continuously for 72 hours uh, across um, the town of Potolbert. Um, people dipped in and out at different times. A remarkable number of people saw virtually the whole thing. Many, many people also watched it online. It was um, one of the most twittered theatre shows ever. <laughs> Um, and it also involved around about a thousand community performers. Uh, this is a um, story of a community that live on a street called Llewellyn Street in Potolba, which is a street where there used to be two rows of houses, and one row was knocked down to create a motorway flyover. So what you get opposite your houses, if you're on the remaining side of Llewellyn Street, is a huge number of concrete pillars with a motorway going above it, with cars that, by and large, bypass Potolba on a journey to Swansea. And this is members of the local community voicing the ghosts, really, of the, the lost side of Llewellyn Street. The event sort of took on a life beyond our imaginings. Um, uh, crowds grew and grew, and we ended up on a, um, a Last Supper that involved a, a um, guest performance by the Manic Street Preachers as the, the local underground guerrilla band, and, and we had to put up huge screens outside the Last Supper because so many people were turning up. And by the, by the final um, moments of, of The Passion, there were at least 12,000 people on the streets um, watching the final scenes. That's the crucifixion. Um, however, I have to say that this, is, um, this was perhaps the most secular moment, in a way, of the whole storytelling, because this was a moment at which many of the stories that Michael and the team of artists working on the show have been gathering from local people were actually recited from the cross. So it was hopefully a piece that respected um, the religious belief of people who wanted to watch it from a religious perspective. But first and foremost, this was a moment of local remembering, where instead of telling a religious message, Michael, as the teacher character who'd gone through the story, told the stories that, um, and told the memories that he caught from people in Potolba over many, many months of research. It was a moment that, to be honest, when I was introduced to it as an idea. I wondered whether it could work, but it's one of the theatre moments that I've been involved with that I would say I'm most proud of and moved by. It was an idea um, that was truly right. And of course we also did a whole bunch of online stuff. So this is patolbert.com, you can still go there, you can see lots of the um, footage there. Um, the Passion has a documentary made of it, it's going to be a film by Dave McKean next year that's created out of the footage, but actually the best footage of all was created by local people on their phones, um, taking pictures, doing little bits of, um, of, of video footage. We had a team of community bloggers who followed the piece and saw scenes that even I didn't see uh, because they were sneaking into places that nobody was supposed to go. So if you go to patolbook.com, you'll see perhaps still the best version of Passion of All. And so we move on to, to um, year two. We spent a lot of time this summer looking at what we'd done. Um, we had an event called the Mega Assembly, which pulled all of those teams from all those different places together and asked people, where should we go next? What should we be doing? So that's one of the young men from Butte Town chairing um, a big discussion about what support National Theatre Wales should offer to local communities. They came back with, to us with their ideas and helped us to imagine where we go next. And then we put together our second year of programme. This is the final image that I'll show you. This is our year two image. It's no longer a theatre map of Wales, but more a journey that we'll be going on. There's representatives there of each of the shows, but there's also um, images that reflect some of the additional projects that we'll be doing. 
the young man in the explorer's outfit, stands for a piece called, a project called Wales Lab, which is our emerging artist programme, kind of our laboratory programme. It would be our, a black box um, space for resident young artists if we had a building, but we don't have a building, so we've decided that Wales Lab will use the whole of Wales as its laboratory. We're going to um, award residencies to emerging and young artists and then place them across the landscape, up hills, on beaches, back in some of the communities that we visited, so that local people get to see work as it's going through its very early and most developmental stages. And also, so as emerging artists aren't only performing and showing their work to their mates or to their peer group, but to a wide range of potential audiences for the future. Um, we'll be performing work up mountains, hopefully on boats. We've got a piece um, that's going to be taking place in a forest. Um, and we're also looking at how we take the idea of sighted work on the road. So, for example, our first show that we've got in rehearsal at the moment is called The Village Social. It's a site-specific piece for village halls. Uh, it's a musical, but it's about a village social that might take place in those village halls. Unfortunately, in our village social, um, over the unfortunate course of the evening, the social turns into a pagan ritual by mistake. Um, we, may, we may not be invited back to all of those village halls, um, but I hope that some of them at least will have a great time. It's been great for me to get an opportunity to share our journey with you. I hope we'll see some of you up a mountain, on a beach, or maybe, given my sense of direction, lost on the road between here and there. I'd be really interested to hear your questions and comments. But first and foremost, thanks for giving us an opportunity at the end of a sometimes exhausting but also very fulfilling year to share some of our journey with you. Thank you very much. really inspirational. I think probably all of us would years ago want to run away and join the circus, but now want to run away and join National Theatre Wales. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we only have time for a couple of questions, sadly. Um, but I suppose I just wanted a couple of things um, struck me uh, when I was listening there. And for one thing, it's kind of amazing the range between kind of an audience of 12 to an audience of 12,000 and the responsibility of that. And next year, the kind of difficult second album in a way after all of this success. How, how do you feel about that sense of responsibility? I think one of the, the biggest things for us to look at in the second year was the fact that if we did the same thing again, yes, we'd reach 13 really um, interesting communities, but of course we'd leave the last, tw last 13 behind. Yeah. So you've got to then restructure the way that you're working to, to respond responsibly and creatively to, to what you've started off. So working out how to put work on the road while still making it engaged is, 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 a, is the big challenge of the yeah. second year. And also looking at, you know, we've got this um, team project that again has worked in 13 different places, but how do we create a Wales-wide team mm -hmm. project and still have a quality of interaction? Yeah. So those are all the things that we're working on. Obviously, you know, online is a, is a friend and, and support in that. And also um, looking at the leadership of people that we've worked with so far. So the ways in which anything from uh, those um, community teams through to the artists that we worked with become um, both our advocates but also their own advocates yeah. and make things like that fringe night in Swansea start to happen mm -hmm. that we can be supportive of but that we don't need to run. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, does anyone have any questions? There's, and then just if you could wait for the microphone players going around. So there's David firstly and then Linda after. Hi John, David Brown from the Arts Council here in Ireland. Um, thank you very much for a very inspirational um, presentation. I suppose the issue of national theatre and what is a national theatre and the opposition between non-building based and building based is a, is a, is a current debate. Uh, if you like, I think here in Ireland we've looked at Scotland and Wales with great interest um, but I suppose if I can be slightly rude, how much did it cost? <laughs> the, the, the opening year's programme that I described um, cost a million and a half Great British Pounds, which is very little. Mm. And the opening grant for the company for its first three years, so including that programme, but including keeping the whole operation going, was three million. So that's not a lot of money to start something off on. Our, our, our 
are probably we're going to average over the coming years around uh, low two millions in terms of, uh, of, of overall turnover. So this is not an uh, expensive operation. I mean, obviously, that's a lot of money for a small theatre company, but for a national theatre, it's probably bare bones. Well, this is kind of a follow-up. How many permanent staff people support you in this vision? Our permanent staff is a glorious 13, about to be 14. So it's tiny. We have a little um, office base in Cardiff in a, in a shopping arcade um, with a, a shop at the bottom so you can wander in and wonder and buy us. <laughs> Great. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I suppose, uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about the um, Scratch That Itch? I love the, that name, those assemblies. Um, for me, that's something, I suppose, in terms of the theme of, of our couple of days here in sustainability that's really um, relevant, I guess. Yeah. I think the, the, you know, our big question actually going into year two is sustainability. Mm -hmm. So how do you sustain the relationships with the communities? How do you sustain a relatively small operating base without um, killing the people involved? Uh, you know, that's, that's a big issue, yeah. you know, sustaining staff and making sure they're not ridiculously overworked. Mm -hmm. um, but sustaining those links with communities is crucial. Um, that example in, in Swansea is a really important one because that event that goes on now is run by a, you know, young, a group of early 20-somethings who mm -hmm. desperately wanted to set up a fringe scene in Swansea, but in a way needed a little bit of support and permission from us. Yeah. And we can now do a huge amount just by turning up. Yes. You know, if it, it, there is, you know, the glory of being the director of National Theatre Wales is actually if you do go, turn up to somebody's show on the fringe, um, that, that matters. Yeah. So we have this really complicated diary amidst everything else of shows that we're going to go and see. And a, a lot of those are about seeing emerging work and supporting um, people who've done something in response mm -hmm. to, to maybe the, um, the, the spark that we set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and generally speaking, how long do these projects take to... Um, happen. I know that you were just mentioning there that someone is starting um, the Somalian man that's going to be working on the project in two years time. Is it generally two years? It, it, it really it ranges from I'd say two years to about six months. Yeah. Um, that's probably the quickest that we've done anything. The Valley show was probably six months in, in total. Um, so to and um, we do, we, we are in a pattern of announcing a whole year's work. Um, that seems to make sense for us because I think people then get to look not at individual shows, but they see them set within a landscape and, um, and people respond to that. Um, so that, that, that will tend to be the, the balance, but also there'll be moments of concentration you know, within that, and certainly in terms of recruiting team and um, really supporting um, those advocates for us. Um, those are things that tend to happen actually by and large in the, in the last four, three, four months running up to the show, mm -hmm. um, because that's the point at which you can also really share the creative process. We, have, we do ask our artists to be very open where they can in their creative process. Open rehearsals are a big part of what we do, um, and really trying to give people access not just to the performance, but to the way that it's made. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful how you're so open to hearing good and bad things as well. Has there been difficult, difficult things you've had to listen to or hear from audiences? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, re a really interesting one, one of the most complicated shows has been that one in Aberystwyth actually with Rimini Protocol because I think that um, a lot of people thought it was something else. They, mm -hmm. they thought it, there's, you know, there's a strong tradition of community arts and particularly actually there's a tradition of digital storytelling in Wales. And so a lot of people thought this was a community digital storytelling project. And for those people who know Rimini Protocol, that's not what they do. They're a very conceptually driven, yes. experimental theatre company. So actually dealing with that, um, with, with sometimes people misreading something as, as one thing and it actually being something else can involve a, a lot of negotiation and groundwork. Um, but again, uh, you know, most of our tiny core staff of 12 or 13 people also spend a lot of time on the road and just spending time with people and, and going through that point where you know, people don't necessarily like what you're doing or wondering what, you know, what, it, what it's about and spending the time to talk it through is, is yeah. really at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I'm hogging all the questions. Would anyone else like to... Ask something. Martin, yeah. What's the, 
What's been your biggest problem or problems? I think our biggest challenge going forward is the relationship of what we're working out the most productive way to work with the with the venues that are across Wales, which are predominantly art centres, um, and have maybe sometimes fairly defined ideas of how theatre fits into, into that programme. So obviously then coming sometimes with quite big site-specific work in, into the area can, can really throw those things up into, into the air. And we have worked with local theatres often um, to um, help, uh, help around rehearsals, also around ticketing, etc. But it can be a, 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 a complex relationship to work through. And I don't think we've sorted it yet. And as we try and go on tour um, with some of the work, I think breaking out of a pattern where drama is something that you put on for one or two nights uh, into drama is something where you, you create a, a much larger sense of event and expect a, a much uh, a audience to come from all over towards the work is it, going to be something that we're going to need to do a lot of work on together. I'm thinking also of the politics of setting up the project in the first place. The po ooh, the, ooh, the, there you go, that's the answer to politics for you, is it? Um, interestingly, the politics have been uh, a, lot, a, a lot of the politics, to be honest, have been solved by the time I got there. Um, the, I think the, the fact that National Theatre of Scotland had been a success was important. I think the fact that Theatre Gennad Lethal Cymru already existed meant that there was a space there for this project, creating theatre predominantly in the English language in Wales. It, it sort of had called, was called into being. But I do think that we faced the issue, the question of nation, and how, how to have a conversation between theatre and nation. Um, and that could have become very problematic, that could have become very difficult. Uh, I think that there were potentially three ways to look at nation. One was through history, one was through a concept of identity, um, and the one that we chose, which was to really look at it through the, the viewpoint of place, and look at who are the people who are here, and what are the spaces that we inhabit. And not to try and define that down into one story, but to say there are many, short, many stories, but a shared place. And that's how we grappled with the politics of nation. And that seems to have been something that's hit a chord with people. Um, sorry, sorry, Tom, we actually have to leave it at that just in terms of our schedule for the rest of the day. But thank you for a very inspirational beginning of the first of this year's Theatre Exchange. It's been a pleasure to listen to you and congratulations on a really successful year. Thank you very much, Tom.